Charlie Smythe. Okay, I'd like to call this uh, meeting of the Committee of the Whole to order. Would the clerk please call the roll? Committee members Barnes, Bowersox, here. Chenoweth, Lewis, present. Roberts, here. Stevenson, present. Mayor Pressing, here. Chair Smythe, here. Um, I know staff is trying to work something out, so let's skip to item number three: the approval of minutes of the previous meeting. Is the motion is there a second? Moved and seconded uh, the minutes from May 17th. Any comments, corrections, changes? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Uh, minutes are approved. Are there any additions to the agenda? Uh, and staff report. Is there any staff report at this time? Seeing none. Okay. Um, we. I'll just say very briefly um, that we got thanked by Steve Carter for the Urbana Police helping the Champaign Police in the recent shooting. They appreciate our help, and I wrote back to him that um, we know that Champaign is there for us when we need them. So we hope everyone gets well. Okay. Uh, public input. Uh, we've already heard from Carl Hill. Carl, that was your piece, right? Okay. Uh, and we have Gabe from 2409 North High Cross, Urbana. So here I am. Um, you know, important enough is something that has passed uh, a while ago about uh, the registration and code enforcement, etc. You know, I, I remember when you were discussing that, uh, somebody put a picture up of uh, one of my buildings and uh, the reason why you had to have uh, <coughs> inspections. Well, I can assure you that uh, if you had an inspector come to anybody's house, they would find violations. And uh, the point of that is, obviously, somebody did not read why there was uh, um, the condemnation of that unit. Um, it was, it rained, then it got cold, and it froze. You know, it could, it's an act of God. That's what they call an act of God. But um, <clears throat> I don't know if any inspection would have uh, uh, taken care of that. But obviously, we can uh, look for anything to give statistics on. So that's that, that's about it. And uh, you know, it's also interesting to have read that uh, you had the minority. Uh, you know, you talk about the minority in Urbana. I think they said it's 17 percent, and you only have 5 percent employed in the city of Urbana. Well, I don't see 17 percent on the city council. So maybe what we should do is uh, find. Uh, maybe a couple of black people to run maybe in uh, Daniel's place and maybe Mr. Smythe and uh, have them returned and opposed. They will have the 17%. You see, there are different ways of looking at things. And um, sometimes you guys don't have all the answers. You've got to look at it from other aspects. I've driven around the neighborhood where they call it historic or West of Banner, whatever it's called, where you have a bunch of professors, and uh, you're out there trying to protect them. There are a lot of houses out there now for sale. What that means is when there is an excess of demand, price falls. So what you're doing is biting your nose to spite your face. You know, it's not, it, it, does, it doesn't work that way. And uh, <clears throat> of course, Bruce Walden is gone, even though people complained about, uh, you know, talked about him. I, you know, we talked about that at the beginning of this new administration, and it's unfortunate to see him go. 
there seems to be that uh, every businessman enjoyed uh, working with him. Sometimes you wonder if, I know that you guys know better than everybody else, you know, and uh, I always like to remind you that it's this very smart city council that had no idea of the difference between stationary weight and moving weight when it puts a bar on a deck, you know. We'll see, we'll see how smart that is. And, you know, um, intellectuals or academics basically control a banner and control most of what is here. You know, um, they're usually, you know, their arrogance to me is based on the obscurity and poverty, you know. They don't really contribute that much to society. You know, they write silly papers and nobody bothers to read. But they tell everybody what to do. Yes. Oh, one minute. Yeah. Well, you know, and of course, I was glad that uh, the city uh, condemned 1507 East Washington. So they saved me a bunch of money. I didn't have to go to court to kick everybody out. You know, so when the city did that, I was very happy. In fact, I'd already, if you don't know, gotten a, a vacant structure permit and paid the $140 before that was done. So here we are. Sometimes you just look at it from the other aspect, and that's what I come to contribute. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Gabe? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, next up is a presentation from uh, Citizens for Instant Runoff Voting. Oh, I'll, yes, okay, sorry. Next up is Justin Kahindos uh, with Senator Mike Furrick's office. Thank you, uh, Charlie. Uh, my name is Justin Kahindos, and I'm the new District Director and State Senator Mike Ferrex's office. Um, I live at 705 West Stoughton in Urbana. I just want to take this opportunity to introduce myself to Mayor Pressing and the members of the council um, and let you know that I look forward to working with you on any issues where our office can be of assistance to the city of Urbana. I know this weekend Charlie already hit me up for $2 million for uh, road improvements for the proposed Menards, $2.5 million for the for proposed road improvements for the proposed Menards on uh, High Cross Road. So th those are the kind of issues where uh, the mayor and the council and city staff should uh, not hesitate to contact me and contact their office because we really look forward to uh, having a strong working relationship with Urbana and all other municipalities within the 52nd State Senate District. So just thank you for uh, your time. Questions for Justin? Mayor. Well, we asked for the 200 million, I mean the two and a half million, 200 million might even be better, but <laughs> two and a half million a while back, so um, where does it stand? He's, M Mike is talking to people in IDOT, but it's pretty uncertain right now whether we're going to be able to get anywhere near that amount of money. Uh, as you know, the state is having some budget crisis issues, um, and there's not really a lot of money being thrown around right now for road projects and uh, the status of the of the governor's proposed capital improvements uh, plan is still uncertain so I, I really okay. couldn't tell you right now if there's a good chance of the city getting any of that two and a half million dollars okay but we're, we're trying though thank you thank you uh, Justin uh, thanks thanks for coming by and uh, my apologies for for messing up your last name I, I will forever pronounce it the Hispanic way given that that's part of my heritage Ah, okay. Well, then I, I'll I'll stick to my pronunciation. Sorry, uh, the Hispanic in me uh, has a hard time saying a J is a J. Uh, any any others before we move on? Okay, Daryl, you're up uh, with uh, with Citizens for Instant Runoff Voting. Good evening. Uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to
to allow us to speak this evening. I'm Darrell Cruz, and I'm speaking on behalf of Citizens for Instant Runoff Voting, a uh, local urban a grassroots organization committed to changing the manner in which municipal elections are conducted in our community, from single plurality winner to instant runoff voting. Beside me is Tom Abram, who is also a member of our group, and they're working on the voice mic. Very good, thank you. Uh, what I'd like to do this evening is just read a statement to you and uh, answer any questions that you have and briefly try to explain uh, to the public in Urbana what we're trying to do and why we're striving to do this. Some of you may ask, why do we need to change our local election system? What is the problem? We believe the health of our local democracy is in a fragile state. Clearly, significant numbers of Urbana citizens feel disenfranchised and disillusioned with our electoral process. Consider the following signs and trends. Few citizens are willing to choose the mantle of candidate and run for office. Third parties and their candidates are nearly non-existent. Often incumbents run unopposed. Voter turnout numbers frequently are embarrassing low. The general public seems disengaged and disinterested in local politics and city issues. Sadly, political discourse is frequently seen as self-serving or negative. Opportunities for open, healthy public debate and dialogue are limited. It appears more and more people are opting out of the very system that requires citizen participation and engagement to work effectively. Without question, something is seriously wrong. Instant runoff voting offers the potential to redesign and restructure the dynamics of the local electoral process and begin to positively and gradually influence many of the concerns listed above. The status quo simply is no longer acceptable to many of the Urbana's residents. We firmly believe Instant runoff voting will enhance and embrace those traditional values and principles that will improve and protect our local democratic system of governance. What is instant runoff voting? IRV is a method of electing single majority winners by, simula by a simulation of, s of a series of runoff elections when no candidate receives a majority of the votes after the first count. So how does this system work? IRV is a very simple and easy voting process for people to use. On the ballot, voters rank as many candidates as they choose in the order of their preference, first choice, second choice, third choice, and so on. This is sometimes called preferential voting. As the ballots are then counted, if no candidate receives the majority, a series of electronic runoffs is initiated. The candidate with the fewest votes is declared defeated and his first choice votes are transferred to another candidate according to each voter's second choice vote. A new vote total is then tabulated among the remaining candidates. This process of elimination and recounting continues until one candidate receives a majority of the votes. Tom can give you a, a quick example, of a visual of how it might work. This is a simulation of a, a five-candidate race, which is unlikely in our um, Urbana municipal elections currently. Uh, we have five different uh, candidates represented by different colors. Um, the majority line is the number of votes required in order to receive a majority by any candidate. In the first round, uh, no candidate has a majority. Uh, red has the least votes and is eliminated. Uh, red votes are then transferred to their second ranked choice. Uh, you can see in this particular instance, one red candidate uh, only only listed them only listed uh, one candidate in the ranking. Therefore, their ballot is exhausted and their um, their choices go nowhere from there on. Uh, the rest of the red votes go towards the candidate where they chose their second vote. Uh, for instance, orange and green. Uh, in, in this instance, no candidate still has a majority, so the yellow candidate is eliminated with the least number of votes, and their votes are then transferred to their second choice. Again, the yellow votes are distributed to orange, green, and blue. 
Uh, and yet again, no, can, no candidate uh, has a majority, so Orange should be eliminated. Uh, in this case, there are several candidates that, that may have already had their second choice here, so it's eliminated. Yes. You're right. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, so Green would be eliminated for the least number of votes, my apologies. But uh, there are several candidates, several uh, voters who already, where their second uh, ranked choice has already been elim eliminated, so then their third choice is counted and distributed in the final round. The, the green votes are distributed to orange and blue, and uh, since the orange candidate's votes have has reached the majority line representing the majority uh, votes, they're, elect they're, they're declared the winner. You can see the uh, orange candidate has a wide variety of different, uh, different candidates' support, so it shows that IRV has a broad support among voters. So what if um, at, at the last distribution of the votes, both of them reached the majority? It's impossible. It's impossible? Well, we have to. You can't unless you have a tie 50-50, which you would enact the tiebreaker rule, which is which happened you know, in our last election for the county board. You flip a coin, flip a coin. or something of that nature draw to decide straws. who wins, okay. yes, or draw straws. Yeah, yeah exactly. I'll ask the question I asked Earl a long time ago, which was, do you have any evidence in communities that use this that it really changed how things work? Because I'd like to see before and after. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got some more information to share, but I'll try to answer your question again. I'll probably do it somewhat like I did with you. Instant runoff voting is relatively new in most municipalities in the United States. It's not something that's been in place recently for a long period of time. Most communities that are using IRV presently probably have only been using it for several election cycles and there are several municipalities where it is passed that they are implementing it in the very near future. As a result, uh, there is not a lot of longitudinal data available to demonstrate exactly the impact in terms of voter turnout in terms of increased number of candidates that might run. What one's basically doing is comparing and contrasting the current system in light of the potential that this change could have, knowing that our current process is not <laughs> meeting some of those needs. I will mention that uh, this Saturday I was at the farmer's market and you know we have a lot of people at Urbana that visit and this gentleman walked up and said, Instant runoff voting. I can't believe it. Do they use that in the United States? And of course, you could tell by the accent, the gentleman said he was from Australia, which is one country that's been using instant runoff voting for years. And he said the people in Australia love instant runoff voting. But of course, he said it doesn't guarantee everybody's pleased because if you know who's the president of Australia, the President Martin, there's some dissatisfaction with their president in Australia. So we talked for a little bit, and he said that they are very satisfied in Australia with the dynamics of instant runoff voting. And it was kind of interesting that he stopped by the table and made that comment. In the United States, unfortunately, we don't have much of a history of alternative voting systems. Well, we had cumulative voting a few years ago in Illinois, and there were other systems tried right after the turn of the century that, for various reasons, were eliminated or voted out. There's some historical dynamics there in terms of why some changes were made. But we feel instant runoff voting is a system that can fit Urbana situation very well because Urbana simply has single winter elections. And it works very well in a city this size. And so that probably doesn't answer your question satisfactorily, but there's not you know, a great deal of data out there. I know cities that are looking at it, like LA is seriously looking at it, they're doing so simply from a money saving standpoint in terms of consolidating elections, primaries and general elections, although we're not proposing that for Urbana. Uh, we still are, are 
advocating a primary system and a general election. But let me, if I can, uh, go on and address what appears to be the strengths of it very quickly. Uh, the benefits of uh, what are the what we see the electoral benefits for Urbana that they can. Okay. 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 So, what are the benefit, electoral benefits Urbana can expect from implementing instant runoff voting? There are many, but let me cite just a few of what we feel are of significance. First, instant runoff voting always ensures the winner will have majority support. Number two, instant runoff voting eliminates the negative effects of perceived spoiler or third party candidates that cannot occur with instant runoff voting. Three, instant runoff voting allows voters to vote honestly and with integrity for the candidates with whom they share common beliefs and values without being accused of wasting their votes, which happens many times when you have three candidates running for the same position. Number five, oh, excuse me, I missed one here. Number five, instant runoff voting can increase voter interest and participation because they can judge and preferentially vote for all candidates, not just one candidate. I can insert a comment. One lady came up at the farmer's market and said, you know, I don't know if I like this system because it's hard enough for me to pay attention to decide what one candidate stands for. Now I'm going to have to learn what all the candidates stand for. And I'm thinking, I'm sorry, but that's a positive thing. You know, it was an interesting comment that she made. Six instant runoff voting encourages more people to seek office because candidates now know that voters have more flexibility and choice in how they can vote. And IRV provides a clear mandate from the people to the ultimate winner. What are citizens for instant runoff voters' current goals and plans? We have started a tabling at the farmer's market the past two weekends, and we collected in just two Saturdays 115 signatures to date. So we've initiated our local petition drive to place a binding referendum on the February 2008 primary ballot. This petition will call for the implementation of instant runoff voting in time for the 2009 city primary elections. Our goal is to have a thousand or more signatures collected by the end of September. We hope to have a presence at the farmers market, at other local venues and community events, as well as conduct neighborhood canvassing drives. This method of collecting signatures will also allow us to educate and inform the public about instant runoff voting. Because instant runoff voting transcends political ideology, we are seeking the support of all the citizens of Urbana, regardless of their political persuasion or viewpoint. A more open, accessible political system benefits everyone in the community. Therefore, we are asking all community and political leaders, including the members of the City Council, to endorse and join us in this positive election change. How can people help and where can they get information? People can help by signing the petition and spreading the word about instant runoff voting. They can talk to their neighbors, family, and friends, and we hope we can initiate that dialogue in the next six months. We would like this effort to truly be a broad local grassroots initiative. To learn more, people can visit our website at www.irv4urbana.net. In summary, or in closing, I guess you could say we truly believe in our democratic system and take our civic responsibilities seriously. We are striving for a more vibrant, participatory, and engaging electoral process for Urbana. Democracy is a bedrock of our system of government. Over time, instant runoff voting will strengthen these democratic processes and encourage more citizen partic participation and interest in issues facing our city. And that is a worthy goal and a good thing for all of Urbana. And we'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions? I have one quick one. Daryl, you talked about the positives. What are the negatives? Locally, the only negatives, you, you can ask the, two, the leaders of the two-party system, and they will tell you what they perceive as being the negatives at times. Uh, for Urbana, I don't see any negatives. And when one 
begins talking about potential negatives of IRV, one of the things I think the discussion we need to be careful about is we have some information about what's happening in Minneapolis where they're initiating instant runoff voting. When you move into huge metropolitan areas, at times there gets to be some technical difficulties in arranging the ballots with the number of candidates and how they conduct their elections that can be maybe a little confusing or complicated to do. Uh, that doesn't apply to Urbana. We have to keep how this process would work in Urbana maybe uh, separate and make sure the distinctions, we're talking about apples and apples, we're not comparing Urbana to San Francisco or Minneapolis, or we're not consider comparing uh, Urbana to a presidential election or a state election. A lot of people come by the table and says, well, when is there going to be a petition to change how we do, do it in Illinois so we can have instant runoff voting? I would like to see it done. But there are other repercussions that can come into play in terms of positive and negatives that one can address in terms of a state process and a national election and in terms of larger cities. For Urbana, I honestly don't see any downside because there's no cost to us because it can be done. Uh, Mark Shelton has assured us it can be done with the uh, uh, election equipment and software that we have that he can design the ballots locally and with the use of it in the primary system as well as the general election and considering the dynamics of the current system in place I honestly see very few negatives if any as it would apply to Urbana I'm not sure I don't Thank you. Any other questions? Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Next up is the uh, Urbana Business Association. just want to make an introduction here. Um, the city has partnered with the UBA for many years to promote Urbana and promote the services and um, various items that we have available here in Urbana that are um, great to live, work, and do business here. Um, and yearly, we usually uh, have a contract that we renew with the UBA where it spells out different categories that we can help reimburse uh, for promotion and different items that we have. So that's in the packet. And then Mary Dennis is here and uh, board member Carl Hill. So I'll let you go. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah. Um, my name is Mary Dennis. I'm the business manager for the Urbana Business Association. And I want to start by thanking you for your support. Um, we um, have a nice partnership with the city of Urbana and we want to keep doing good things to promote Urbana. So we've had a busy 12 months and uh, I'm just going to do a real quick thumbnail sketch of some things we've been up to. Uh, the Sweet Corn Festival, which is our biggest event of the year, um, was a huge success again last August. We had about 30,000 people come through the two-day event. Um, we sold about 20,000 ears of sweet corn and we used about 450 pounds of butter. So um, even with some rain on Saturday, it didn't dampen anybody's party mood. So it was a good event. Um, followed shortly thereafter by the International Beer Tasting and Chili Cook-Off. Um, that was held about four weeks after sweet corn. Um, this year we had about 2,500 attendees. Um, there were 13 chili cooking teams. Uh, the weather was beautiful, so I think people had a good time with that. Um, following the outdoor farmer's market end in November, um, the UBA picks up the event and moves it inside Lincoln Square Village for five Saturdays. So we did that from mid-November until Christmas. We averaged about 40 vendors a week. And uh, the, the tenants inside Lincoln Square really like this event because it increases foot traffic in the mall, increases their sales um, on those Saturdays. So we've actually um, surveyed those tenants to see how they feel about the market, and they like it. So we'll keep doing it. 
Um, another thing I want to mention is the Builder Banner Program. Um, we have a committee that works on this program year-round, and uh, we do three big events as part of this program. One is the um, Realtor Breakfast that we hold in October. We had about 85 realtors, builders, and uh, developers at the event. We had um, six presenters, um, a nice breakfast, a lot of good information for the realtors and builders. Um, then we do uh, the Realtor Bus Tour in March, and we filled the bus, took realtors all over Urbana and showed them the parks and schools and um, things that are good that are happening in Urbana. Um, then we just finished the Build Urbana Home Parade, which was June 3rd. We had six subdivisions participating this year. And uh, the weather was beautiful, so we had a good turnout, and uh, I want to thank that committee for all their hard work. Um, one of our busiest committees is the marketing committee, and we began a general marketing campaign in October for Urbana businesses by category. So we started with tech, technology companies in October. We've done retail, fitness, the arts. Um, financial services, so we're going to keep doing that um, with ads in the News Gazette and, and appropriate publications every month. We're also about to revise again the Downtown Visitor's Guide. This is a marketing piece that we distribute widely, and uh, it needs to be updated about once a year, so it's time. So we'll be, the marketing committee will be taking up that. Um, we work hard to coordinate ribbon cutting ceremonies and groundbreaking ceremonies for new businesses in Urbana. We've um, done at least 12 ribbon cutting ceremonies in the last year. We're also a member based organization, so we have about 85 business members currently. And for those members, we do monthly networking events. We have a quarterly member mailing packet that goes out to the members. I've got an extensive email list. I try and keep all the members updated on things that we're doing. Um, I have a strong and supportive board of directors, so I want to say thanks to all the board members, including Carl Hill, for all their help and support. Um, our mission is to promote Urbana as a dynamic place to live, work, and do business, and we um, thank you for your support and hope that you'll continue to help us out. Yeah, thank you, Mary and Carl. I really support the UBA, and it's been another good year. Um, I also support the increase in funding for the UBA this year, and I just want to ask a few questions about the budget to make sure I understand it. Um, first, it looks like the way co-op ads happen is changing, and I just wondered if you could really briefly explain, is the city funding the co-op ads more, and are the people whose names are actually mentioned in the ads still paying for them as part of it, or how does that work? This general marketing campaign that we started in October um, is really not a co-op advertising program. We don't ask those businesses to pay anything um, okay. for those advertisements that we place. This is basically our, you know, part of our mission to promote Urbana. And um, we do highlight the UBA members in those ads just to give them a little extra attention, but um, it's not really co-op. Okay, great. And one of the situations that we're in, particularly this fall, is that the, the playing field about the smoking issue is a little uneven in that Champagne establishments can choose for just a few more months whether or not they allow smoking, but in Urbana they don't have a choice. So I wondered particularly whether you had given any thought to that and to whether some of the ads um, and marketing you're doing could particularly be in this fall period to promote the fact that we have some amazing live music venues, amazing um, outdoor seating and sort of bar scene here, and mm -hmm. um, the music circuit, especially in the, the summer months and in the fall, is really hot here. And mm -hmm. I wonder if there's anything that can be done while, while the time is right this fall to, to market and hit people with that message. I think that's absolutely possible, and I think it's a, a very good idea. Um, our marketing committee is very active and hardworking, and that's something that we'll definitely be talking about. Okay, great. I think yeah, with with the with the city funding more, I just hope that we can miss or that we can make our opportunity before we sure. miss it to make sure that people can learn about what's so so great here in downtown Urbana. The last question I had is about the Sweet Corn Festival. It's kind of a similar question. You know, for years there's this discussion of does the Sweet Corn Festival help our downtown businesses? And really, we sure hope it does. We want people to learn about all the great retail opportunities downtown, from the shoe store to the bakery, and so on. And 
I wonder what, um, obviously, the sweet corn and the map and the way it works is already set for this year, and the train has left the station, and it's going to happen real soon in August, and I hope people are getting excited about sweet corn. But I wonder what, in future years, um, you've talked about and what could be done to help work more with businesses, things like not putting vendors or um, or booths in front of the downtown businesses, encouraging them to stay open and actually going around and talking to each downtown business owner about having them be have extended hours during mm -hmm. the festival, or even doing sidewalk sales where they can open their front door and play some music and bring their business out to people as part of the festival, rather than as they've done in past years, kind of shutting their doors and leaving town because they say, I don't want to be part of this commotion and the parking situation is too hard for my customers, so I'm going to turn off the lights and lock up and go home. What um, I know changes this year really too late to be made, but what can you do and what can you all think about doing for future years so that we make sure we're really in synergy and helping the downtown businesses? It's funny that you should ask that because um, we just, um, today, I've got three interns working with me this summer, which is mm -hmm. fabulous. And um, I have one of them working on a project. Um, she's developing a survey to... Uh, distribute to the downtown businesses once the festival is over to get their input because I don't know that I mean we haven't done that since I've been around so I want to I want to talk to them and get some input from them in terms of what they like about the festival what they don't like ways that we can make it more um, business friendly for those who think it's not um, so we're working on that that's great thank you very much Dennis uh, maybe I'm a little curious about the uh, results of the bus tour with the realtors. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think it's a really uh, positive and uh, important aspect of uh, your activities to um, alert the uh, realtors in the area of the uh, opportunities in the urban area. and. Um, you know, and maybe uh, introduce them to um, uh, the new uh, and, and the varied kind of housing stock that we do have here. Mm -hmm. And I guess I was wondering, um, you've been doing it for a couple of years. Uh, what is the comments that you receive on the tour that show that they're um, learning things or uh, somewhat maybe um, surprised perhaps at what they're seeing? And I'm wondering, do the people who attend, and you said we had a full bus this time, which mm -hmm. is pretty good, um, are these, uh, do they tend to be uh, real people who come into the realty business fairly recently, or are these uh, long term realtors who are taking the tour with you and um, you know, just seeing what's new now in Urbana. I think it. I think it goes the spectrum. I mean, there are new people on the bus, and there are also people that have been around for a long time that just didn't realize some of the advantages of, of real estate in Urbana. And I um, was standing outside the bus as people were getting off the bus after the tour was over, and every single person said, wow, this was great. I really learned a lot. You had good information for us. The food was good. Um, we had door prizes for them. I mean, I think it was a positive experience for all of them. And we're actually talking about trying to do more than one a year because it was such a success. Well, thank you very much. Well, yeah, really. Well, I just want to thank Mary and the UBA. I think they really do a great job for Urbana. Thank you. So I told them I thought they had a good budget proposal. <laughs> Heather. Well, um, my grandfather was a realtor in Urbana and really um, strived to get people to Urbana, and so he would be very proud of you, Mary and, and Carl. And um, I think he would I just, be. Yes would like to encourage you to continue your hard work and thank you for all your hard work and obviously it's paying off because there's a lot of redevelop or not redevelopment but new development and all around you know southeast and and even out by me in, in the northeast urbana area so thank you and um continued success thanks heather and i'm not here just to be pretty so i'll go ahead and say something <laughs> uh i'm the trophy member, I guess, of the board of directors, not like a Walmart trophy, you know, not one of the big ones. But uh, it's been about six years now, I think, since we've started or since we combined the Urbana Business Alliance with your, the uh, Urbana Developer and Builders Association, and I think it's fantastic uh, what we've been able to do uh, by bringing together the downtown people and the developers that are mostly on the outskirts, but a lot of remodelers trying to do things in town. Uh, 
I can't uh, say thank you enough for your efforts, uh, continued efforts, in uh, promoting Urbana as a dynamic place in which to live, work, and do business. But uh, from the developer standpoint, from the builder standpoint, uh, it's just made a world of difference. Uh, we now have 13 or 14 subdivisions in Urbana. And when we started this, we had maybe three that were trudging along. So uh, the Builder Banner program is working very effectively, and uh, a large part of what we can accomplish is through the Urbana Business Association. So yeah, we appreciate your support. I'm, I'm glad to see that uh, the contract looks good to you. Um, and as someone pointed out, this is more money than what we had before. But everything is marketing, and marketing is everything. So if we can continue to, to do this, if we can memorize that and actually put it into use like we've been doing. And I was reading through the agenda or the, uh, the notes, the work plan that Mary put together. I got tired just reading it, let alone trying to do all this stuff. So I think the, the, she's done a fantastic job. And I'll say thank you to the board of directors, too. They, a lot of them work very hard, much harder than I do, uh, at making things work. And thanks to Kathy for trying to work for you guys and keep us in line and all that type of thing. It's very difficult, uh, but it's been working very effectively, and we are seeing the fruits of that effort. So thank you. Okay. I know Tom wants to jump in here at some point, but I'm going to get a couple of quick things here. Uh, one of the things I like about uh, the UBA is, uh, you know, no matter how wacky my ideas are, Mary always welcomes them. You know, she never says no to me. She never says, you know, you're nuts. Uh, so, and, I, and I've asked for a lot from UBA. Marketing is one aspect of it, helping us with the city marketing. And, and you know, we've, got, we've made a major commitment to, to up our image a bit as well. Um, I have two, two comments. One is extending Brandon's. You know, if we can come up with a way during the Sweet Corn Festival to take those businesses that want to and sort of bring them out into the street in front of their location, you know, that that that'd be you know one thing I'd I'd like to see done. Uh, I think um, you know that's one way to include those who want to be included. Uh, and then my other comment, and you intrigued me with your comment about uh, the merchants in Lincoln Square liking the market inside. Uh, which brings me, uh, why should we ever close it? Should we keep it going in the months when it's not outside in, you know, February, March, and April? Um, how would you feel about that? And, and would it be welcomed by the merchants in Lincoln Square? Um, we talk about it um, every year, about extending it. And I know um, before I came, the market did run into January, February, and maybe March, um, but the organization didn't really feel like there was enough activity after the holidays. It just kind of, every, everybody just kind of stops coming. So that's why we made the decision to, to end the market right before Christmas. That gets the best of that time period with holiday shopping and gift ideas and things. Um, and then I don't know what happens to people in January, but maybe they've spent all their money before <laughs> before the holidays. I don't know. Um, I, I guess another thing I would say is that um, we have limited staff and limited um, person power to run that event. Um, it's basically me. So it's um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of fun, and I think you know the vendors like it, and the shoppers like it, and the tenants like it. Um, I'm not sure if the novelty would wear off if if it went longer. That I think it's something we can certainly explore and talk about. You know, I think there's something we said for a break in January. Mm-hmm. Okay, and, and I, maybe pick it and up. then maybe pick it back up, and we can we can keep talking about. It. I just okay. uh, and, but it's worth you know if you talk to the merchants. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we talk to vendors, and Kathy can, can you know, we can, we can figure this out. Sure. Maybe there may be a subset that would be interested in starting back up in February, mid-February or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, and, and take advantage of it. It is a wonderful indoor space. It so, is. Uh, and, and ways of taking advantage of that, I think, uh, are needed. So well, and I want to thank Lincoln Square Village because they let us use that space for free. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a nice situation for everybody. Yeah. 
We will uh, have we'll have uh, six weekends this year instead of five. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're adding one more this year. Right. Uh -huh. But uh, the, the staffing problem is a problem. Sure. Uh, Tom, did you want to jump in? You're sitting in the city attorney's label there. I didn't know if you've gotten another hat here. But. Sorry, I was just I was just looking for an open mic. Um, actually, I have something to add when um, Mary and Carl are done. So, anything else? Any other questions? Well, then, thank you very much. Thank you. Should they stay there? No, it's it's really um, for council's benefit. You do have before you a contract and ordinance related to uh, the UBA contract. Uh, the item is listed on the agenda as a presentation, and because it's not specifically delineated as a contract and an ordinance, uh, we're, um, you have a memo and a contract and ordinance put together by Kathy before you, but um, it's a recommendation that we don't actually act on the contract and ordinance and make sure that it's specifically delineated on the agenda at a future meeting. So should this be... Should this reappear in committee in two weeks or just simply be included as part of the, the budget process and, and we direct it to be included in the budget? I, I believe that it should be put on the agenda for committee in two weeks to give fair notice to the public that there is an ordinance being considered. Okay. Then a motion to send this to our next committee meeting would probably be in order. I, I would make that motion. Dennis. Uh, Okay, um, motion by Dennis, second by Heather to to send this. Oh, I'm sorry, Libby, go ahead. We really were trying to get it in this um, budget sequence before the budget's approved. That's why it came tonight. Uh, unfortunately, the ordinance wasn't on the agenda, so that would put it after the budget's adopted. And if it's possible, since the presentation's been tonight, if it's possible to bring it as a new item to council, that would be desirable uh, mayor <laughs> I've asked that it be included in the regular budget process and I think they're planning to change their fiscal year so we're going to bring a list of uh, changes to the initial budget that was presented to you before you approve the final budget so we could include it and then you can vote on the contract as an individual item but the appropriation can, can still be put in the budget because we're still revising the budget um, so now I'm going to turn to Ron. So could we have this as a as new business in next week's council meeting? I suppose so. It's especially if it's on the agenda for for the you um, go to the council to the committee for the council. next uh, council meeting. Yes, you could. But I think you, you I think it's just appropriate because it is an ordinance and it is involving the appropriation of certain monies that it be enumerated as as such on and on the agenda before the council acts on it okay so well we have there's two pieces of this there's the appropriation of the money which is in the budget already which is already under consideration the contract is a separate matter mm -hmm. and we could the contract part can go to committee then yes and the appropriation is already in next week's budget yes presentation that's, yeah. that's okay. fine yeah okay so so the motion then to, to is to send the contract to committee two weeks from now um, that that works fine then I think right okay. yes I would agree. that's an, uh, um, an appropriate amendment to the motion okay uh, or adjustment to the motion Is that clear with everybody okay Heather says yes Danielle are you still with us okay uh, so uh, any further discussion on sending this to committee in two weeks the contract in two right the contract in two weeks the appropriation is already part of the budget but yeah I still didn't understand that I I thought that even the contract could be just as an, a new item on next week's council meeting. It, it doesn't it, really it, matter which way, but I know staff want to get it done so that it can be acted on and finished before the year's over. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, well, we have uh, we have another council we have uh, we have another council meeting in uh, in on the twenty fifth of June, or no twenty fifth? No, we wouldn't. You're right. Okay. And then there's the 4th of July weekend. Yeah, yeah, so it really would be better to send this to council next week. Ron? As far as I'm concerned, either one of those solutions is fine. My biggest concern is really not when it's done, it's just that the public be given fair notice that this is an agenda item and it's going to be voted on by the council. So that can be either accomplished if you want to do it all in one fail swoop, all meaning 
the budget consideration as well as the contract as a new item or you can you know since it's already in the budget you can kick the item to the committee the next committee meeting either one is fine I just want to make sure that no one comes and challenges the passage of that right. ordinance yeah. well um I guess my feeling is that since it's in the budget, the appropriation is in the budget, and that's been under consideration for some time, including a hearing tonight, that piece is fine, uh, and that will come to us next week. But the contract uh, has been discussed tonight. It could be entered as new business next week, uh, and that would, that would work as well. So uh, if that's a preference, then we should withdraw the motion and, and make a new one. Okay, and then I withdraw the motion I made. Heather? Okay, a new motion would be in order then. Then I would move that uh, the, the contract be uh, moved to appear at next council meeting next week as a new item. Okay, is there, there's a motion and a second to make this a new business item next week. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Uh, motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is resolution number 2706012R, resolution ascertaining prevailing wages for the uh, fiscal year 2007-2008. Uh, Ron, did you want to say anything about this? I don't know that I have anything more to add. It's our annual resolution that we're required to pass by state law for our public works projects. Heather? I would move that we uh, send this to council next week with, with the recommendation for approval. I second that motion. It's been moved by Heather, seconded by Dennis to send this to council with a recommendation for approval. Further discussion? For the public that's watching, this is uh, this is an annual schedule of prevailing wages and benefits as provided by the Illinois Department of Labor that uh, that we approve for all contractors in the City of Urbana Public Works projects, and uh, this is a, a yearly event. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Uh, motion carries. That will be the next week's council meeting. Uh, next up is an ordinance reviving the annual budget ordinance, uh, General Reserve Fund uh, 2007. It's uh, ordinance number 2706052. And uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's just uh, uh, one page on the flip side here. And this is. Uh, Uh, does anybody, want, anybody from staff want to speak to this? Uh, it's a it adds an employee termination benefits of sixty three thousand nine hundred seventy one dollars and reduces the general reserve fund balance by the same. Any discussion? A motion would be in order. I move that uh, ordinance number 2007-06-025, an ordinance revising the annual budget concerning um, uh, changes in the general fund be approved and sent to council. Is there a second? It's uh, been moved by Dennis and seconded by Robert Lewis uh, to send this motion to, or this ordinance to council with a recommendation for approval. Any, Brandon? Yeah, um, I guess I'm not prepared to vote on it one way or another without just some explanation of of the cause, some memo or description or something. So I don't know, Mayor, if you have a brief explanation or or what's appropriate. But I'd yeah, like to understand it a little more. Yeah, we have an employee who's leaving on at the end of June, and this would account for the accrued benefits. There's nothing except accrued benefits in this money. And, and it's also creating a new line item. I talked with Ron Eldridge about creating a line item that would distinguish um, paying out benefits at the end uh, from salary. So that's the creation of a new line item. Okay. And, and do, or, do or the do funds account? in this case, I mean, are... This is general. Um, this is coming from the fund balance of the general fund. And will this... Well, we basically make up for this in the fact that the salary 
I mean, that there will be some period where we're not drawing on the salary of of an employee after they leave. So I, I don't we'll know if the short two number, I don't know if the two numbers are going to be the same. There okay. probably will be a little bit of savings until a replacement is going to be found, but I wouldn't necessarily say that those two numbers are going to match, which okay. is why we're paying it out of an account called termination benefits rather than from the salary account. Okay, perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> Further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, motion carries. Okay, uh, this brings us to item number nine, and we still have quite a bit to go. Um, this is uh, budget presentations, and first up, uh, Deb Lissack from the Urbana Free Library. There is a revised uh, library budget uh, that was included in the packet. It's not, you'll find it's not very different from what is, in fact, the bottom line is different from what was in your spiral binder from the city. Bottom lines are different. There's a few differences in some of the departmental lines because at the time we bought our budget request to the city staff. I'm sorry. Can you hear? At the time we brought our budget to the city staff, um, they asked for some reductions to bring us more in line with the typical increases that were going to departments. And so we did do that, but at the time when that was requested of us, we didn't have a board meeting. So we really didn't have the right to make those changes without the board. We did a little speculation about what was likely, and Ron put those numbers through in the spiral binder. The board did come through and say, meet the city's request. It just came out in a little bit, a few different places, but not substantial. So I came to answer your budget questions, but I will just give you a little bit about the state of the library. Not a lot, but um, the library is generally busier than it's been in the past, and it just continues to grow the number of people who like to come in the library and stay in the library. And we get so many positive comments about the building. I mean, the outside of the building, people really appreciate the fact that we made the effort to make it match and look, you know, like one unit all the way through matching the older building. And the inside of the building, that even though it's doubled in size, it still feels cozy. People still feel like it's a really nice place to sit and stay. We get comments from our own users. We get comments from visitors who are just so complimentary about what an amazing job we did here compared to things that they've had in their hometown. So lots of comments about that. A couple of the um, things that make it really pleasant in the library now to stay is that we have very good wireless throughout the whole building. And the new Latte Dog coffee shop that opened just in April is doing really well. You just see a lot more use in the front rooms where people just settle in for the day and stay. So a lot of activity. It looks really good there. The other thing you'll see reflected in um, our budget is the board's commitment to trying to strengthen our collections again after all the years of really tight space. Our collection um, expenditures as a percentage of budget really dropped below the state recommended uh, minimum and recommended standards. And that's concerted effort on their part to try to bring that back. It'll take us years to do it slowly, but you can see that reflected in the budget. Um, other than that, I would say the library's focus towards the future will be outreach, um, particularly to new users and people who haven't been in the library in a long time. Even though we have one of the highest per capita uses of libraries anywhere, we still have a fairly low percentage of cardholders compared to our population. So that means the people who do use the library use it heavily, but there's a lot of people who haven't been in the library in a long time. So that will probably be our focus in the future is to try to reach out to those uh, people who haven't been there find out what we can do or what we're not doing that they want us to do. <laughs> I can give you one really quick idea. Um, I am a library card holder, but I tend to go to Champaign because I can get their books for four weeks versus two. Thank you. That's a, that's a really positive thing to know. And one of the things you'll see in the budget, and we moved this as one of our cost-saving efforts in the, in the revision, we moved it to the non-recurring costs, is that we intend, we hope this fall, to do a needs assessment and to do some kind of direct mail that goes out to the entire community. Surveying your library users in-house doesn't tell you as much as surveying users that don't come there. You will, we will, should be able to find out more. And of course, designing that, the trick is how do you get those returns on that survey? How do you get get those back in so you have the information? And we may do the kind of approach where we do something online and we do something through mail and do it a couple of different ways. But that's the kind of information we need to know is what, what keeps people coming and what keeps people away. 
Okay, questions, uh, Mayor, then Dennis. I, I think we need to make a revision here. Um, I think our cost of living is going to be 3.25, correct, Ron? So we need to correct your budget on that to keep everybody on the same. Right. So you need me to send Ron that new right. thing. Right. Okay. Dennis. Yeah. Um, you do list a few one-time projects that are going to be funded in the future. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is uh, an update uh, for um, uh, Urbana Public Television equipment to be um, added to the auditorium, and I'm assuming that's going to be so that there can be a live broadcast, or not just record, not just recorded, but actually streamed to right. the studio. I think that's very important, and I really support that. Um, I w was wondering. Um, if uh, in your needs survey, you will um, attempt to contact people who are outside the um, city boundaries to try to encourage um, more use for people who live certainly within very easy driving distance to the library, but because they don't live in the city boundaries, they may have to uh, pay a fee to um, right. use the uh, library. And it's always been uh, somewhat of a concern of mine that there would be that um, differentiation because it's a it's a it's a perceived barrier to the library use, and I'm not sure how you um, if that even can be mitigated in any way. But um, it, it should be addressed, or you should reevaluate. When we do the survey, we the, the least expensive way to do it is to do a direct mail that goes out to sort of every resident household as opposed to address. To do that, we actually have to hit everybody in the postal area, so we will automatically be hitting people outside. Mm -hmm. We will have to be careful in the design of the survey because at the same time you're trying to welcome people and invite and ask what they want that creates a, um, what can be a negative if people feel like you've just welcomed them and reached out to them to find out what they want, and then they find out they can't use it without paying yeah. something additional. Mm -hmm. The reason that occurs, though, is because of state law. We're not actually allowed to offer library service free to people um, who don't pay taxes because, in other words, then you're asking the Urbana residents to pay taxes to cover the service to people who don't pay taxes. So we're actually obligated to charge a tax replacement fee so that it's equitable as opposed to free for some and then it costs. The perception is that it's free to the Urbana citizens, but it isn't free. They just pay for it in their taxes. In their taxes. Right. Um, do you think that it's likely that you would have a, um, uh, a sliding fee based on um, uh, income or based on, say, a senior senior use fee or something like that? The way we do it currently and, and is that we base it on property tax. So basically, if you live outside the city limits, we would do it as if you lived inside the city limits. Yeah. We take your property and say this is the tax rate on your property, and so this is what it – that basically just equalizes it based. Do you have, are you, would you ever consider a, a senior discount? for uh, library use? I have to look at that. I probably have to find out if that's something within state law or state library, sort of maybe not law, but regulations, if that's something in a pro that's Okay, appropriate. I'm just I'm asking. Not, I'm not sure if we have that free, the freedom to do that mm -hmm. or not. I would have to look into I'm just that. looking at ways to increase potential uh, usership, I guess. Yeah, I wonder. And sometimes I think that just the promoting to people, letting them know that it isn't, it, again, right now it's based on property. It isn't always expensive depending on where you live. Yeah. There is an additional exemption if you're over 65 in your property tax. I don't know if that gets reflected in, in the in the it, way that it the number gets Because calculated. we actually, in fact, to make this easy for people, we once a year request from the county a printout of all the properties in Urbana and Summer Township, so that would be the collar communities around us, so that it, we don't have to send someone traipsing around to find their tax bill or go to the courthouse. We actually request a printout um, by address, and we do ask for the net property uh, taxing base. So we actually asked them for the net with the uh, exemptions already reduced from it. So we should, we usually hope to be able, unless there's some complication in, in the uh, property showing up in the printout, we hope to be able to give people that information right off the bat and tell them what it is. Well, now county assessments are all online and can be uh, downloaded off the web in a minute, in a second. And so it may not be even um, necessary now to ask people to bring their printed yeah, items we in. We could just actually bookmark that at our circulation desk so that we could go to that easily. That's right. People. Other questions for Deb? I've got a couple of quick ones for you. Um, um, I just wanted to point out to everybody that that uh, buried in here is uh, some revised Internet aspect uh, working on a fiber 
connection between here and the, the city building, the library, and the city to the county, uh, so that we can get uh, fast, faster access. Uh, they're, they're the increasing demands of of the hardware and the software and whatnot. Uh, uh, internet uh, speeds are need to be increased. So fiber is is one thing that's come, coming charts, along. Our IT manager printed out our bandwidth charts for me for the last year, and we are like way peaked out. All, always over like the seventy five percent line, and really up at the top. We've been so overloaded for a year, and we've really been working on this for a year. But yeah. trying to look for the best long-term solution instead of doing a quick fix. And Bill DeJarnette's been working us right now with the fiber track. And it's part of the holdup with the auditorium, the UPTV. We started that route, and, you know, if we have fiber directly to us, we have a lot easier way of um, connecting that and making that possible. So um, everything's sort of hinges together. Another big, big expense are utility costs like everybody else, and, and there's a 50% increase in here for that. Uh, one one thing I'm going to ask Deb put her on the spot here is, uh, uh, as you know, there's a there's a green initiative that's been started as part of uh, City Council goals. Uh, the library will be looked to as as a participant in that. Sure. Uh, something that uh, need to be thinking about. And one thing I noticed the other night when I was walking through downtown at about uh, 11 o'clock at night was there were a lot of lights on in the library and the library was closed and I didn't see any janitors in there cleaning. So. Um, it is the. Um, it seems like a lot to us. Also, it's the emergency lighting that, when the building was wired, these were the parts that were wired to stay on. My assumption was that this was done according to code. That there has to be some particular distance where the eyes have to be on. That's just my assumption. But um, Pat Bloody had arranged for Todd Rusk, is it, from, that's doing the city audits, to come over and do an audit on our building too. So he has been there. He actually came in one night at closing and followed our custodian around. So as lights got turned off, he marked which things are on, and so he he took all that data on which lights stay okay. on when the building. Yeah, because the second on. floor, well, the, the the main floor and the top floor were mm -hmm. dark. The the lower level was really lit up. It was not what I noticed, but so it may be that somebody just didn't hit all the lights. It's possible, uh, but he but he did come and he did take that data. He also has looked at our HVAC. We have a computer that monitors all sorts of things, and he spent some time looking at that, trying to see if there are ways to save energy. Yeah. Did he? Did, is there anybody looking at the possibility of doing green roof on the library? Because that's that's I, a pet project. I don't know. At the time we did the construction, we went with a white roof in order to reduce heat costs. But I don't know that anybody's looked at the green. Di totally different concept, but we did put some effort into obviously the heat loss that comes from the roofing. Other questions for Deb? Thank you very much. Thanks. CD, Libby, all by yourself? do not have very many changes in this year's budget, but there were some changes last year which I wanted to talk about and to give an update for each of the divisions. And these changes were um, very important and we thank you for them. I'll start with building safety. Um, what we did in last year's budget was add the rental registration program as an expansion to our housing inspection program. So uh, that has since passed as a program and now being implemented. We've added a second housing inspector, that's Stephen Chrisman. Um, it's working out fantastically. We've also increased time from our um, part-time clerk typist, Sharon Humes, now works three-quarter time, and this is to specifically to keep up with our rental registration activity. Um, we are in the final throes of the first registration. Uh, we're down to a very uh, relatively small population of properties that, to our knowledge, have not registered, and um, these are um, 85 roughly outstanding out of about 2,200, but the good news is that these are all very small um, properties, uh, just single family. About a quarter of them are actually from the capstone quarter. So these are recently acquired condominiums, uh, likely uh, individuals who did not know that they were um, um, going to be part of this program. So we're working with the management there to track them down. And uh, for the most part, these um, this remaining population would be in the $50 to $80 range in terms of registrations. So essentially, all of our apartments have registered, and they did do that um, promptly and cooperatively 
cooperatively. We had great assistance from finance and building the database and doing the invoicing and the repeated reminders and uh, and I will be working with um, legal staff to get those cleaned up and then we'll get to do this again in October and then about a year from now we'll be doing our 18 month report and we've been collecting um, comments and ideas on how we can improve the rental registration program so uh, really appreciate th this new program we think it will help the city quite a bit also accomplished in building safety this last year of course was the new code adoption very major effort um, we do an annual, Gordon Skinner does an annual report, a calendar report for building safety. So if you're interested, I can get you a copy. It's very detailed. Uh, we have a, a great computer system and just some factoids out of it. Um, of course, every year is a busy year in building safety. Um, I can give you a sense here. We uh, obtained revenue from building permits, et cetera, of $427,000, very significant, the permit activity. Um, we did over 4,000 inspections in 2006, 4,310 inspections. And um, let's see, we issued over 2,000 permits, 2,242 permits. And we have a housing report in this as well. Uh, we've been tracking um, the time it takes us to resolve tenant complaints. That has fallen from an average of 34 days in 2004 down to 21 days in 2007. And there's uh, additional information if you'd like to have a copy of this, I can get that for you. Um, moving on now to economic development, and Tom is here with us tonight. Um, we did in this year's budget add additional training time, and you'll see that in one of the TIF funds. This is for additional attendance at trade shows, um, particularly to attract retail tenants for our new commercial development in Urbana and additional conferences and training for economic development staff. Last year, we started in the budget the public art program, and that continues this year with a half-time public art coordinator. Um, this is Anna Hockhalter. She's done a wonderful job. She's working closely with the Public Arts Task Force uh, that's underway with its work and a variety of other projects, um, including a request for design proposals for creative reconstruction of our newspaper vending rack in downtown, just as an example of uh, some of the projects we've taken on. Uh, Tom and his team have done a terrific job. Um, one thing that we do is not just work within departments and divisions in the city, we also have a cross-departmental team approach. And I think one of the most important teams we have now is the economic development team. Uh, the mayor sits on this team along with representatives from legal and um, uh, finance, public works, etc. We probably have about 15 different active projects that we're tracking as well as uh, certain programs that we track. We have some important partners in economic development. You heard from the UBA this evening. We also um, work with the EDC that came to a previous council meeting and the CVB. You hear from economic development on the monthly reports that Tom and Ryan provide, um, as well as special topic reports, say, for example, along Philo Road and our neighborhood business meetings, et cetera. Uh, we are working now on the marketing RFP for marketing services and have just uh, begun work with a PhD student intern for the summer to help Tom with that. Her name is Kate Nessie. Moving on to planning, this is why well, we usually spend our time at council and that um, pertains to a lot of the paper that you receive. I think last week's council packet was over an inch thick and it was literally all planning items from the uh, planning, different planning commissions and uh, um, so you're well familiar with our planning staff. Um, last year you did add a planner one position. We thank you for that. It's helped us um, uh, stay on top of all the cases and the, uh, the new development and new requests that we process as well as new community initiatives. And so Jeff Engstrom is our planner one. Also recently, um, working with the mayor, we have allocated funds from our neighborhood improvement fund or the NIF fund for the Crystal Lake area plan. And this is a fun acronym. 
has a sound to it. It's clap. And tomorrow night we'll be doing a public workshop for the Crystal Lake Area Plan at the Anita Purvis um, Nature Center at 715. So that, that will be fun. It's going to be interactive, and we're very interested in hearing from that neighborhood. We currently have a Planner 2 position um, open that we're reviewing applications for that. And you're well familiar with all the many other projects that we've worked on, neighborhood conservation districts, the landmark cases, zoning studies, uh, design guidelines, et cetera. Reporting for this division, you will find um, largely in the commission reports that we do each year from Zoning Board, Plan Commission, Historic Preservation Commission, et cetera. So I'll refer you to that. Our last division I'd like to report on is the Grants Management Division. And this is managed by John Schneider. I would like to take a moment to provide special recognition to John Schneider and to our um, contract assistant, Sheila Dodd, for um, the great improvements they have undertaken in completing um, improvements to our HUD performance reports. And so this involved um, the whole range of the filing system that HUD looks for, computer reporting system that HUD mandates to the budgeting that is done. And with respect to our home funds, for example, we did, it's it's a story with a little sad, but also a good story that we went from pretty much the last in the state to the second best in the state in terms of home reporting. And in fact, our home, HUD coordinator, Amy Hudson, has been commended for this improvement. So um, it's, it's very important that we've had that improvement. Um, I do thank and recognize John and, and Sheila for this. Um, we have been through many years of some staff turnover and learning on the job, and now we have um, very skilled people working on this. And in this past year, in addition to improving the reporting, we completed our consolidated plan, annual action plan, amendments to all prior annual action plans, and um, corrective actions from our, our monitoring reports. Um, in addition, special projects in the form of Crystal View Townhomes with the Housing Authority, the Kerr Avenue Project, Scottswood Drainage Benefits, Weber Street Lights, um, all the different CHOTOs that we work with and other projects that are outlined in our annual action plan. We do have a new, um, relatively new home coordinator, Janelle Gomez, and if you haven't met her yet, you'll be meeting her soon. And Kelly Hartford is here tonight as well for social services, and she's our CDBG coordinator. And of course, uh, Randy Burgett and Connie Eldridge round out that division. You'll see um, just one small change in that budget, um, which, by the way, for grants becomes more and more difficult because of budget cuts at the federal level that we need to continue to do more. And monitoring requirements increase, but we need to do more with less. Uh, we did lose a position for retirement, um, and we've asked uh, Kelly and others to pick up those programs. They've been able to do that. Um, but one small change you'll see is some software that we will be acquiring that will help us with our time management within grants management. So that's all I have in terms of an update for community development and some of the positive budget changes that have been made. Are there any questions? Dennis. Well, the department does such a great job, and you have uh, such a wide range of um, operations in community development department that it is, uh, you know, well, all your workers have been so commendable. Uh, my, I guess my question is really one not so much of the current, I guess it's really going to miss the current budget, but I guess it's the future. Um, you know, one of the commissions that you uh, have within your uh, uh, community development is the Historic Preservation Commission. And uh, we have had discussion here about um, establishing some kind of funding f to uh, promote historic preservation in the city. Currently, we don't have um, uh, a line item, an annual item for a, a budget um, funding. But in the future, we may. And you know, if the, if the city council so chooses to move in that direction. Um, so if there were to be a change in um, uh, our um, programming uh, later in this year uh, coming up, do you think that there would be possible uh, to uh, make ad ad additions or corrections to our community development budget and find some funds? Or, or have, is, is, your, is your situation such that funding is so tight that um, 
future items like this may uh, be very difficult. I think that if we were to look at um, doing some grants or loans for historic preservation, it would need to come somewhere out of the general fund, so it would be a broader discussion. Um, we have very small training funds for historic preservation on the order of three to five hundred dollars, and we use that to send our commissioners to um, conferences and, and learning opportunities and provide some reading materials and things of that nature, and we do tend to use that small budget, so we would look elsewhere um, for that, and I believe this will be coming back with some recommendations um, July 9th. Thank you. Other questions for Libby? One of these days I'll total up the number of emails I send you and the number of responses, but I suspect you probably half of my uh, staff folder. So uh, a, lot, a lot goes on in CD. Thank you. Next up is the executive department. Hey, Mayor. Well, it's okay if I talk from here. Um, we've had a lot of staff changes, but I think you'll agree that we have um, very good staff. Our new personnel director, Vasilia Clark, I think is doing very well, and she's got a great staff. And Todd Rent, our new human relations director, is doing a fantastic job. He's been on the the labor negotiations team, as has been Vasilia. The legal department, we've got new attorneys and new clerical people, and they're all really great. And we still have Jack Waller, who kind of knows everything, because you know he's he's been around for a while. So I think we have a really um, good combination of people there. And um, the mayor's office, um, I'm very grateful to have such a, a good group of department heads. We have very talented people in Urbana and they all do a really good job. And my secretary, Jolinda, uh, works for me and she works for the human relations director and she does a fantastic job and she also orders the pizza when we have meetings. But I appreciate her because she knows a lot. And so there's been some activity. Uh, I'm the liquor commissioner and you have some ordinances before you today. I don't know if um, Danielle still on the line or not? Yes. Oh, okay. So, you know, Jack Waller answered some of her questions. So we'll get to that when we get to the liquor things. But if anybody has a question about the executive department, I'd be happy to try to answer it for you. No questions? Thanks. Okay. Um, next, next up is finance. Ron? The man with the money. Look at the stack he, he's got there, reference, okay? So, prepared for any question, right? Um, I, don't, I, I don't have much to say. I could talk a long time about finance department and some of the things we do, but I know we have a long agenda tonight, and our budget is, is almost identical budget to what it was last year. There are no new costs, no new personnel, no new changes of any sort, and my total increase was a 3.6% increase, and now almost all that was a cost of living adjustments in personnel. So. I would, uh, with that, uh, answer, try to answer any questions you might have. Questions for Ron? I guess uh, uh, while, while you're sitting there, are there anything about any of the special funds, TIF, um, Vehicle Equipment Replacement Fund, or anything like that that you'd like to mention now, too? So I'm, I'm going to have a question in that area in a second. but I don't have, I can't think of anything right now. I wasn't, probably wasn't prepared to talk about the special funds, but. Um, I, there's nothing I can think of that I would like to bring up right now. Okay. Um, just out of, out of curiosity, I know that we collect uh, uh, a vehicle and equipment replacement allocation comes out of every department, right? And then how does it, how does it turn around and go back? You know, it, it includes what? Cars, computers, fire trucks, police cars, everything is in there, right? And how does it, how do you... How do you allocate it back to these departments? It includes uh, all the all the large items of equipment, uh, furniture, and virtually everything. And what we do is we have a long list, a replacement schedule. Uh, for example, cars. We purchase a car. We know that in probably 10 years or 12 years, whatever that useful life is, that car is going to have to be replaced. So, basically, we set one twelfth of that replacement cost aside each year, so that. 
when a large item comes due, such as a fire truck that might cost a half a million dollars, we have money available and we don't have to uh, increase the property tax as maybe some smaller cities might have to do and then lower it back down. But those, those would be very disruptive to people. And we allocate it back based on that schedule. So we divide up in the year and all those vehicles are assigned and that's how they're allocated to the departments. Um, you know, since I, since I get into the technology aspect of things, and uh, I, I like the fact that we're, you know, moving ahead on fiber and, and, and that sort of thing to improve our, our uh, connectivity. Um, and, uh, and, and, and Bill even told me about a, a, backup, a backup connectivity plan, too, which I thought was a, a, was a really good idea. Um, how, how fast is our... How fast do we turn over our technology, and what do we do with the old technology? Uh, geez, I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, it has slowed down. As far as uh, if you're talking about like PCs and equipment like that, of course it has slowed down because you know we they, the, they're able to last longer and do the job. Um, I think Bill is, and his staff are more focusing on some of the larger technology issues that we've been talking about. Um, and the connectivity and uh, the the, the uh, internet, our website, and those sorts of things. I think they're going to be dominant. Probably going to be dominating. You know what he's working on in the next couple, next year or so. Uh, and, and my last comment uh, would be: uh, I know, you know, one of the things that uh, I've seen a lot of departments on campus do is they've replaced a lot of their CRTs with LCDs because they use a lot less energy. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know if uh, anybody's included that in their thinking, uh, but I would hope that in, in all of our, our green thinking that we think in terms of the energy being used by our computers, shutting them off when we can overnight. Um, I know that can screw up uh, backup schedules, but you know that can be accommodated. Um, also, the use of uh, alternate technologies like uh, uh, cell phone PDA combinations, that sort of thing, uh, those are becoming more and more efficient uh, you can you know of course the problem is is that our staff are so devoted already that I'll get an answer to email at 11 o'clock at night having sent it at 1045 uh, I'm not sure if we put crackberries in their hand that uh, it would it would uh, you know mess up their family lives even more or something uh, so I, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure I want to go that way but but uh, you know if we have have staff that that want to use that technology uh, can use that technology. Um, I would I would encourage its use, and and likewise uh, anywhere we can save uh, save some energy in terms of switching to LCDs and and uh, turning off computers overnight and that sort of thing. I would encourage it. I would agree. You know, why don't I why don't I ask Bill to just write a little uh, you know one page uh, memo and I can put in a packet about what it, some of his plans on on the, you know lowering the energy costs and some of the things that he's planned to do. Okay, thanks. And and also how we dispose of, of old computer stuff mm -hmm. because that's, you know, it shouldn't be landfilled. It needs, should be recycled. If, Currently we're taking them all to the recycle place. Uh, you know, uh -huh. I hope they get recycled from there. Okay. Mayor. I just want to thank Ron for all the stuff that he does. You can just ask him a question. If he doesn't know it right off the top of his head, which he usually does, he can look it up for you, and he's really been invaluable in um, our labor negotiations because he can calculate what the tr true cost is going to be. And he doesn't just look at what's happening right now, but he thinks to what the effects will be in the future, and that's really good. So thank you. Heather. Um, what does the rainy day fund look like? Well, uh, that's what the rainy day fund called our general reserve fund, which we had a budget amendment on tonight. Um, it, that needs to be improved. You know, that's one of the one of the areas of the city and our long-term financial stability that we need to, uh, you know, think about and figure a way to replenish that. We had um, there's a there's you can argue uh, as to how much money a city should have in a savings account. Uh, you know, some people would argue they, they should have uh, a percentage of their budget or different factors like that. 
I think uh, some people would say that, you know, most taxpayers would rather have it in their pockets rather than you collect it from them and save it for a rainy day purpose. But there certainly is some level, and I think generally probably around $3 million is what we used to have in our general reserve fund would be a goal to, to get back to. And recall that we that was really depleted down by the landfill abatement, the old landfill abatement, which ended up being, you know, extremely expensive over a number of years, really almost three million dollars itself. So that we're down to now about six hundred thousand in that fund. So Well, that's going to be very difficult to do. I mean, we just came through a period in which our, you know, our revenues were kind of boosted up by, uh, you know, the additional sales taxes from Walmart and the O'Briens and the quarter percent. And so that would, you know, that would have been an option. And we did, we have added considerable expenses to our budget, personnel, police officers and other costs uh, this year and utility costs and things that we didn't really have any choice over. You know that would have been a, that would have been one of the options is to to not you know incur those additional expenses and put some of that. But um, I, I don't know. I, it's on my list. There's things that we're going to be talking about. I think in the next couple of years, and uh, hopefully, if we get a another um, a, you know inflection of our revenues where they jump up again, maybe we can figure out a way to you know spend some of that money off into our reserve. Fund. I guess I would concur that it'd be nice to, you know, get a 10-year plan to replenish it to a certain level. Be, right, without raising taxes, yeah, yeah, it would be nice to do. Um, one one thing I like is the, the, the vehicle equipment replacement fund, and I've been vowing to do that with the library uh, for the seven years I've been on the library board, and I vow to get it done before I'm done on this last term. Uh, I keep meaning to meet with you, Ron, because I want to I wanna actually have a, a you know, a, a version of that, uh, for the library, and I know that you keep some reserve funds of the library, uh, sort of informally. Uh, but I'd, I'd really think I really think that it'd be good to formalize that process uh, because uh, you do such a good job with the rest of the the budget and keeping us, you know. Everything runs very, very smoothly and very predictably in a way, and that's that's a very nice thing sitting on this side of the of the of the table uh, to have. And so uh, I, I think that's that's something that I'd like to see expanded to the library if we can. Um, and uh, so because I know every year they they have a list of items and they go look at liquidity and they call it liquidity, but that that seems sort of like uh, it's not as planned as I like, given what I'm spoiled with by you. So I'll, I'll be coming to you at some point with that. One of the things we do not provide for in the vehicle equipment placement fund is our buildings, our structures. We're not, we've never been able to set money aside to replacement of this building or the public works building or a garage or any of those sorts of things, the library building. You know, we, we, we would just have, we of course may have monies to maintain them and keep them up, but sometime if you decide that you have to build on or replace a building, you know, we'll have to figure a way to pay for that, whether it be debt or whatever. Other questions for Ron? Thank you very much. Are you going to speak for the city clerk's office? I know the budget is pretty much the same as usual, right? It is. I think uh, generally the comptroller presents the city clerk's budget, but I'm sure if she was here she'd tell you about her excellent staff. <laughs> probably go over that. <laughs> I'm sure she would. <laughs> Ron, I know you've sat back down, but is there anything to add on the city clerk's budget? Or is it pretty much the same as previous? Yeah. And he's nodding his head no. Okay. A any questions on the city clerk's budget? Okay, seeing none, we'll flip the page here. Okay. Okay, everybody have a copy of the... Uh, of the social service allocation now in front of them? Yes, sir. Okay, seeing that, uh, we're back in session. Uh, Kelly, do you want to start or do you want Danielle to start? Go ahead. Um, basically, before you is the um, compilation of all every, what everybody was looking at for allocating <coughs> different agencies. Um, the, the darker on your copy is the motion um, 
some of them are the average there are some that there was no majority so this is um, I think the motion that Danielle is looking at for council I, I guess you want to take it since you haven't looked up you want to take a few minutes to look at it Danielle do you want to add anything as people are reading through this Yeah, I guess I could describe the, the two changes, and maybe what I'll do is put them in writing and bring them back next week, because I, I know a number of people are looking at it for the first time. Um, but I'll just say that all in all, this looked very good. There were two agencies that I felt we shortchanged in that actually they had four or five votes, or four or five of us wanting to fund them at a certain level, and yet the motion funded them at a lower level. And so I, I really wanted to look at it and find a way to give both of those agencies what they got last year, um, because at least five of us had said that. The first of those agencies was Family Service, and they, in the motion, uh, they have maybe six or seven different line items, but in the motion, we were giving each of them significantly less than we'd given them last year, even though if you look, each of them had at least five of us who wanted to give them um, what they got last year or what they asked for this year, which are 3% are off. Each year, Family Service is very conservative, and when they come ask for funding, they, they ask for just a cost of living adjustment. So I really think since five of us wanted to fund them fully, that we should do that, and that would require um, $3,000. And five of us voted to do it, so, um, so I really think we should. The second agency that I think got, was shortchanged is the Greater Community Aids Project, GCAP, um, even though Four of us had voted to give them the full 7000 the same as they got last year, and that doesn't count me. I actually made a mistake um, in filling these out because I wanted to give them the 7000 they got last year as well. But even not including me, there were four votes, which is a majority of us, that wanted to fund them at 7000 and yet the motion um, suggests a decrease for them. So I would like to find the $1,000 so that we can fund them the same they got last year. So in both of those situations, I think five of us want to do that. Then the question comes, if, if we really are going to find those those extra monies, the $3,000 to keep family service at their level and the $1,000 to keep GCAP at their level, where does that come from? And my proposal is that there are two agencies um, that got large increases this year, even though when I look at them, um, there were only, there weren't actually four votes for, for such a large increase. And those were Don Moyers Boys and Girls Club and the Mental Health Center of Champaign County. Um, I'd like to take $2,000 out of the allocation for each of those agencies. In the case of John Moyer's Boys and Girls Club, that would give them 12000 instead of fourteen. So I would propose giving them 12000 instead of fourteen. That is still $2,000 above where they were last year. Only four of, uh, There were only four of us that had voted to give them $11,000 or higher. So really, there's only a majority of people who wanted to give them $11,000, but I'm still proposing to give them twelve. In the case of the Mental Health Center of Champaign County, um, I would propose taking a thousand from each of their two programs, the homeless youth program and the time center. They would still be seeing huge increases above last year. Um, the homeless youth program would that would take it down to nine thousand dollars, but that's still far greater than last year's fifty eight hundred dollars. 
And there were only four of us who had voted to give that program $7,000. So um, moving them to the $9,000 level is still more than, than four of us, more than a majority had chosen, and still a large increase. Same with the Time Center. Um, reducing that by $1,000 would take them to 10500 And that program last year got 8600 So this is still a large increase for that program. If you look at our, our individual votes or what we chose, um, there were only four of us who voted to give them even $9,000 or more. So, so um, moving them down to 10500 is still, again, higher than what four of us had chosen. So I know that was, I'm sorry, oh, higher than, that was at the level five of us had chosen. Okay. Can I just ask a question? Yep. Can I ask a question? Yes. Oh, it, I, I appreciate that you saw the change in family service. I knew that there were some increases in some lot items and decreases in others. I actually hadn't figured out the total difference. I thought that it basically came out as a wash. I was looking at my spreadsheet and it looks like the difference between what we gave them last year and what the motion is, is actually 1750 not 3000 So just a clarification, is it your understanding, would you like to give them more than last year or? Yeah, I would, I would propose to give them $3,000 more than is in the motion. That would be their full request. I know each year. Okay, yeah. So Yes, and that's because five of us, if you look, really had chosen to do that. Yeah, no, I yeah. see that. I just didn't, for some reason, I thought you said that it was $3,000 less than last year. I'm sorry, yeah, you're right. It's $3,000 more than the motion. Yeah, and just to speak to that, I, I support that. I think that the, some, the numbers for John Lewis and Mental Health Center were extremely high because they, some people kind of put all their money in, in a few pots, and so it bumps the average up. Well, at the motion, at the moment, there is no motion on the table, so um, somebody's welcome to, to do that. Mayor. Very, very minor point, but on um, the Senior Resource Center, the motion is actually slightly higher than the request. Um, family Service, line 23, application 23, they asked for 530, the motion gives them 550. Hey, it's only $20, but it's more than what they asked. So you might want to go through here and just adjust it and make sure okay. that the extras go to where they're under. Okay. Um, Brandon, I think, uh, I think Danielle was practically asking you to make a motion here. Uh, Okay. Is that my understanding of what you were saying, Danielle? Yes. Yeah, I'm happy to make that motion, too. I, I, can, I can move this so that we can discuss it and then make a motion to start looking at amendments. Um, I move this, the motion that I present to council, and, you know, invite Brandon to amend it as needed. Is there a second, second to second. Danielle? And Brandon seconds that motion. Okay, so we have a motion uh, that is the spreadsheet as listed, uh, as printed out. And uh, at this point, uh, further discussion. Um, hmm. I don't know. I'll try. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Brandon. Okay, I'll. Uh, the mayor just asked if a seconder could amend the motion, and I don't know. I, I think I can, so I'll try. Um, so that that pink motion is on the floor, um, and I would I would present briefly the amendment that I described that we. Um, would slightly alter the pink motion to add um, $3,000 to the family service lines to bring them up to their request. The total of all the family service lines would then be 44250 and, and the breakdown is kind of odd. They have not quite round numbers, but the total for all of family service would then move up to 44250 And we would also increase uh, the GCAP line. That would go up $1,000 to a final value of $7,000. We would offset that by decreasing the Don Moyers Boys and Girls Club line by $2,000 down to $12,000. We would decrease the Mental Health Center Homeless Youth Program uh, down $1,000 to $9,000 and the Time Center down $1,000 to $10,500.
Is there a second to Brendan's motion? Uh, so the mayor asked them to um, look at those that were over allocated and redistribute. Okay. So, uh, okay. So it's been been uh, an, an amendment has been proposed by Brandon, seconded by Robert, um, with, a with a friendly adjustment there, which is basically just to change that 550 to 530 on line 23. Is that correct? And plus, plus we had rearranged the, the numbers individually, yeah, which can be fixed for, for the final version of this. Um, any further discussion on this amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the amendment, huh? Okay, one, one opposed. Okay, motion carries. Um, is there a discussion on the main motion, which is to uh, al is to uh, send this recommendation to council uh, as amended? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, Kelly, I think uh, you've got numbers to work with. Okay, I will make the changes. Then. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Anything else on this? Thank you very much for your work, Danielle. No problem. I appreciate the input. Okay. Uh, item number 11 are the liquor license amendments. And do you have the, the memo in front of you from Jack Waller? Yes. Okay. Um, Mayor, would you like to take this one? Or Ron? Um, the first one was to establish the caterer's um, license. And I guess there was a question about that. I, I think it's fairly straightforward. Does anybody have a question about the caterer's license? Danielle? No. Just no. Clear. Okay. Okay. Uh, the, the only question on the, on the caterer's thing was that Jack gave us two versions with and, with, with and without the uh, markings of the liquor bottles by the uh, caterer. Uh, so it's up to us to decide which of those two versions we want to send to council. Does anybody have a preference one way or the other? Or should we just go with Jack's original, which included the markings? Original. Others. Anybody else? Heather, go ahead. It's about the markings. It's the yeah, there's the only difference in the two versions that Jack gave us on 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 ordinance 2705042, which is an ordinance establishing a class CA caterers retail liquor license, is with and without uh, a marking control. Okay, the first version is with a marking control. The second version is without that control. And, Yeah, well, I, I think, yeah, given, given that the caterers work across Champagne and Urbana, they do one, yeah, we should, just, if Champagne's doing it that way and it works and nobody's complaining about it, I don't see why we should change it. Yeah, so that's my feeling. Okay, a motion to send this to council would be, there's a motion by Robert to send this to council, a second by Heather. Is there any further discussion about sending this to council? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, the second. The liquor license uh, amendments is uh, ordinance 2705043, an ordinance establishing a university-related organization liquor license. I think this is where Danielle had the had the questions. Is that right, Danielle? Yeah, I, I mostly wanted to hear the justification. I, I feel that uh, the caterers license is really not to my concern. Okay. Is there a motion on this one? It's been second. Moved, it's been moved by Robert, seconded by Dennis to send this to council. I assume that's a recommendation for approval? For approval. For approval. Uh, is there any further discussion of this item? 
Uh, seeing none, all those in favor of sending this to council signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. We'll see this one next week. I, to item number 12, an ordinance further amending Chapter 3, Alcoholic Liquors of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Urbana, granting the Liquor Commission authority to revoke liquor licenses due to riotous or uncontrolled civil unrest. That was the very last thing in the packet. Okay. Um, this came about because we've had from time to time problems with crowds that get kind of out of control, and, and we did have a, an officer once. Um, closed down an establishment so the feeling was that we really need to kind of tune up the ordinance to reflect this and um, this is Ron O'Neill's innovation so perhaps Ron would like to discuss his O'Neill patented <laughs> ordinance here um, first let me tell you a little bit about some of the background I, I did take a look around the Midwest and some of the college towns Madison Grand Rapids, East Lansing, Terre Haute, South Bend, um, as well as um, DeKalb County, uh, and let's see, Des Moines, Iowa, um, as well as Champaign. Um, first thing is that uh, Champaign has a similar provision in their code of ordinances. It would be in Article 6, um, Section 582. Um, they, they do make provision for allowing the commissioner to, when the commissioner has reasonable belief that, belief that the continued operation of a particular premises will, they call it, immediately threaten the welfare of the community. And their ordinance allows for a seven-day suspension and then followed by a hearing. Excuse me. Yes, uh, that's correct. Closed for not more than seven days, and then a hearing will be held um, within that seven-day period. Um, and um, the hearing will give the hearing gives the licensee an opportunity to be heard on the matter. We already have a mechanism. We're empowered by the statute, the Illinois uh, Liquor Control Act of 1934, um, to for the to give the liquor commissioner those powers to suspend or revoke a. Uh, an establishment's liquor license. The this particular amendment anticipates something more short term and something more of an emergency nature. This would be, in, in, for an example, when there is a crowd within or without a an establishment that we license, where the crowd has become riotous, it's become out of control to the point where. Um, someone's uh, or many people's health and safety may be harmed where there is a continuing nuisance it could be noise um, it could be people milling about in the streets and other measures to control that have are not being successful um, upon application by the chief of police or the chief of the fire department they could request from the liquor commissioner which would be the mayor that a temporary suspension uh, be put in place and that um, would be 24 hours and what that does is that minimizes the impact on the business in terms of its long-term liquor sales but does allow the city to maintain some control and prevent people from being hurt or property from being damaged um, by the continued sale of alcohol in many establishments once the alcohol is cut off you can then maybe more easily disperse um, certain crowds. Dennis. I guess I have three three questions that came up when I read this. Um, you know, and uh, you know, this potentially is a fine ordinance. I'm just wondering about how it works. So the police chief, it's uh, 1130 at night or midnight and there's a potential riot occurring or there's disruption so the police chief has to phone or call or wake up the mayor and then the mayor what signs a piece of paper so that this can be activated it's not i assume by word of mouth that uh, the permission is granted is there some kind of legal process that has to take place 
Well, I'd imagine that that would be established by rule or practice after your upon passage of this. I believe it could be by word and followed up by. Yeah, I would not want the mayor to have to get up at, you know, midnight and go to a fact, find a fax machine and fax something to the police chief. I believe that it would be done by verbally initially followed up by something that she would sign off in at the next practicable business day. It is something that I think when the there be exigent circumstances that call for immediate action. You know, mayor, things are completely out of control with or within or without this establishment. And I believe that we need to shut down sales of alcohol at least until the next morning or the next day. And the mayor would say, OK, that's fine. You can do that. You can invoke that. Now, if it came down to it and that's not working, practically speaking, then perhaps we could have some other mechanism in place. Keep in mind, though, it also says the liquor commissioner or his or her designee. So the mayor could designate another person in such circumstances to do that. For. I'm just wondering about the I don't I guess you call it a question of fairness or whatever or impartiality that designee would not necessarily be the police chief. No, I don't I don't I wouldn't anticipate that. And if if I were asked, I would not advise the mayor to to have the police chief be able to of his own volition, nor do I think the police chief would want to of his own volition, you know, unilaterally shut down a business even for 24 hours. But I mean, the mayor, it could be another city employee. It could be perhaps. OK, it could be somebody else. It could be somebody else. OK, mayor. It would be the mayor pro tem, wouldn't it? It could be. Danielle, are you prepared to? Sure. Are you asking me if it's OK with the police department calling me at 2 o'clock in the morning? Yeah. Well, yeah. OK, as long as you're not at the party, she says it's OK. You you would have already called me, right? OK, OK. Now, I do have two other questions. Go ahead, Dennis. The second one is it's not really clear. So I was wondering if there could be a predetermination that, say, because of unofficial celebrations that that due to maybe past behavior, would this ordinance change place into effect a preclosing on a certain 24 hour period to avoid a problem? I think you you because it doesn't say you can't do that. I I didn't anticipate doing something like that. I think now you're getting into some due process issues where a business would have a right to say, hey, you know, if you're going to do something like that and cost me possibly a lot of money that I'm deserving of some sort of hearing on the matter. And, you know, you get into a very sticky situation where you're saying preemptively that I'm predicting that something bad is going to happen and I'll shut you. I want to shut your business down. So I would say no, that would not be wise. Exactly. That was done last year. Earlier this year, the St. Pat's unofficial St. Pat's celebrations where what where was this a business that was shut down or was was you were you just saying that people couldn't gather illegally? No, that the the amount of liquor that could be and the way it was served was adjusted and times, you know, the time that you could open up your your establishment was changed. It might be something you've gone through proper procedure and in some certain due processes is is given. It could be in the matter of a resolution that's going to go on an agenda. I'm sorry. It was done with notice and everything. So it wasn't just, you know, just out of the blue. So my question is, I don't I didn't find wording that would prohibit that from happening. I mean, it's not clear how or when one might make the determination 
that it was important to protect the peace by closing an establishment down. So I was asking about the process. You, so you're, you're wondering in time how this would, would, would work. It, it anticipates that, you know, it's, I guess I, I felt that it was implicit if at any time for the purpose of preserving peace. And if you look down at the second line, it says to abate any imminent continuing public nuisance or ongoing criminal or riotous behavior. So I think well, the ongoing is clear, but the imminent could be um, two days. Two days from now, we're going to have a party, and we don't want to have an event that's going to cause a riot. So, T typically, in, in any type of statute where you're using the word imminent, imminent, it is commonly interpreted to mean it is about to happen right, okay. right now. That's why I'm asking you because you're the lawyer, and it wasn't clear to me okay. as a reader, and I didn't create this. Okay. okay so and the, and the third one, actually, you've already touched upon is that if indeed um, such a suspension was um, enacted by our, you know, the police chief we got the word from the mayor or the mayor pro tem and, you know, informed the um, the uh, property owner that uh, his, um, his license was going to be um, suspended for 24 hours now, and he violently disagreed, um, what what possible litigation would the city um, face for loss of profit because of such a suspension? Well, wow, that's difficult to to discern. I, I mean, you can sue anybody for anything. Um, if you're asking what our potential exposure is, I think you know, in limiting it to 24 hours, and limiting it in terms of um, when it can be enacted. I intentionally put a, a higher standard here. This is a situation that anticipates um, someone's going to get hurt or something is completely out of ch hand or there's some sort of riot going on. The things that I can think of off the top of my head that would trigger this would be a situation I'm sure you all have seen on the TV when, you know, a team wins the Super Bowl or, you know, uh, or wins the World Series and people pour out of the bars or pour out in the street and start tearing things up or if you got a situation where there's an event going on at a local club or bar and maybe the capacity for that place is 200 people and you know there's a thousand people in and around that that bar or club um, so I suppose they could go ahead and sue the city but I think you know, we would be on safe ground saying that this is a regulation and rule that's enacted pursuant to the Illinois Liquor Control Act of 1934 and our local ordinances, and it's designed to protect public welfare, and it does it in a minimally invasive, invasive way. Okay, well, that's a good good answer. Um, you might, I don't, I mean, I'm not a person who crafts legal ordinances, but I, I wonder if it's useful to include um, well, maybe it's not because it's becoming specific where property damage, I mean, will something like the act of property damage uh, initiate uh, a, you know, would be a good good reason to initiate such a, such a suspension? Well, do you want to, I mean, like, I, one of the things that happens is maybe somebody breaks windows. Or riotous behavior. Or, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And, and I put, so it's covered, you think? I put mm -hmm. ongoing criminal or riotous behavior, and I wanted to not get into specific acts okay. because then you start to get into a question of, well, how many windows have to be broken before this punch is in? I think it's a judgment call. All right. we would we would grant that, uh, you know, the, to the chiefs of our local agencies. Okay. I'd just like to point out a typo. Yeah, we've corrected. Third line. Okay, you we've got it. A okay. Couple of typos Anybody else, Brandon? Yes. I have two questions. Okay. It's appropriate. Okay, go ahead, Danielle. Then Brandon. Okay. Um, and and Ron, I appreciate that you're soft spoken, and it's also a little hard to hear you. So if you could speak oh. up a bit and speak into the microphone, so I can hear the responses. Oh because yes, ma'am. Well, to answer your first question, and it may cover the second one as well, um, 
this would not be a shutting down of the business. It would be a shutting down of sell the sale of alcohol. There might be a, there, there there might be a business who, for example, serves food as well as alcohol, and as long as the alcohol is shut off, that people can sit very peaceably within inside the establishment and continue enjoying their meal. Um, we don't want to be draconian, so. Um, no, it would not anticipate shutting down the place unless, of course, there's a riot going on inside and, you know, in the interest of public safety, I, I think then a police, you know, um, acting in their, um, in their authority could, could go and empty out a place, but that's not what this statute's about. The second question, I'm sorry, could you repeat that one? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. I I had considered putting some sort of provision for warning in there, but again, you know, we're talking about a situation where that may not be practical. Yeah. Um, for a, yes, if there are some, some, some safety issues or, you know, if some, some group of, you know, hooligans are about to tip over a car or something like that, you know, it, it, it may be a situation where the owner of the business may not even be available, you know, and perhaps the, the police could talk to the management or the chief, fire chief could talk to the management, and I anticipate that they would, they or their designees would talk to management and try to work out a solution. I think this is, you know, I'd like for the council to think of this more as a nuclear option. It kind of gives, gives the... Well, one thing that Ron can't see and Danielle definitely can't see are that uh, both the fire chief and police chief are nodding their head yes, they, they would provide uh, yes. substance, you know. <laughs> okay, uh, understood, understood. I hear you, okay, that satisfies my question. Brandon. Ron, I just have two very short sure. comments, and you can actually take them or leave them. I okay. just wanted to, to point them out. One is, in some cases in our language, we say his or her, but here when it says the chief of police or his designee or the chief of the fire department or his designee, we leave out the his or her. And someday we may have a her there. I know we have a first in that we have the first female mayor of Urbana right now, yeah. so I think that could happen too, and you might add the his or her part there. The second uh, comment is about the time hours of operation in section 33 below mm -hmm. it looks like we didn't update our ordinance when the time change thing happened it talks about the last sunday of april and last sunday of october when the when the time changes but i think mm. that state and federal law is different now and it's a different weekend so okay. just for correcting that we if, might if need to amend to that. that you could yeah. okay understood with regard to the his or her mm -hmm. you, you may not believe this but as i sit at my computer and type these things i'm tortured over that type of stuff i i, uh -huh. I you know it's a it, drafting ordinances is, is part art part legal research and you know you want to make uh the language so that it's readable and not too wordy and sometimes doing his or her can be um it can make it a very difficult read but Believe me, I do consider that, and there are just times when I leave it out for for the sake of brevity. It's your call. I just point. Yeah. Sure, there. sure. Thanks. Okay. Is there a motion? Any further discussion? And then is there a motion? Go ahead, Robert. I wasn't. Good. I, oh, I moved. We go. Uh, so moved. I'm moving forward to City Council for approval. I second that. We have a motion to send this to council and a second by Dennis Roberts. Is there any further discussion? I assume we'll see the, the, the daylight savings time changes fixed. Yeah, okay. Um, any further discussion on this? Seeing none, all those in favor signal of saying aye. 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 The agenda jumps from item 12 to 14. I assume there is no 13, right? <laughs> oh. Yeah, okay. Okay. Heather. Before we adjourn, can we please, we didn't do it last week and we didn't do it this week, the Pledge of Allegiance. Oh, I'm sorry. We have yeah. Memorial Day off. We, have, we, we, have a do, it last week we do it before week. council meetings, so next week's a council meeting. It should be It should be on the agenda for the council meeting. And and the 14th is Flag Day, so we'll be close sing? to it. What? The National Anthem? Uh-huh. <laughs> we can have someone play it in the back.
Okay, so that'll be that we'll definitely get it on okay. for the council meeting. So, <laughs> Thank you. okay, I so it's a, it's a minor detail to some. No, it's my it's fault. I missed it. I missed it last week, it, we, and we're, we've been on a off, off schedule. We don't do it at committee meetings. We do it at council meetings. We should have done it last week, and it wasn't on the agenda, and I I forgot. So it's my fault. So, we'll we'll do it next week. Don't forget. Okay, seeing no further business, we're adjourned.